nice to meet you. My name is Andrew Cowell and I have been serving for the last 13 years as a missionary in Southeast Asia. And whilst I've been serving in Southeast Asia, I've had the privilege of visiting many different countries. And what I have discovered in each of those countries, whether it be Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Korea, is that many, many believers have yet to do a systematic study on the topic of spiritual growth. And so that is why I think it'll be very beneficial to you to follow this series, this eight part series on spiritual growth. It is a series on the subject of spiritual growth. I would like to start by introducing you to my son. His name is Aidan Micah Cowell. And I just want to explain why my wife and I chose to name him Micah. There's a very, very good reason. And that is because of a verse in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. And we want this verse to become my son's life verse. We want this to describe his life. This is what Micah 6, 8 says. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What a fantastic life verse. Now that verse sums up my expectation as a human father. I have an expectation for my son and it's summed up in that verse. But that verse also gives my son a definition of what it means to be a man of God. But that verse also provides motivation for me in my parenting role as a father. Now what I want us to realize is this. If I as a human father have an expectation for my son, and if I have a definition of what it means for him to be a man of God, and I have a motivation that propels and drives my parenting, surely that is also true for our perfectly and our perfect Heavenly Father. He too has an expectation for each of his children. He too has a definition of what it means to be a child of God. And he too has a motivation for why, the way he shepherd and leads us as his children. And that is what I'd like us to study now. In this first session, I would like us to look at the overall purpose for spiritual growth. And in this session, we will study three things. It is important for every believer to understand that our understanding of spiritual growth needs to be based on three central concepts. The first concept is this, God the Father's expectation for spiritual growth. The second concept is God the Father's definition of spiritual growth. And the third concept is God the Father's motivation for spiritual growth. Let's begin now by looking at the first part of this talk, God the Father's expectation for spiritual growth. In brief, God the Father's expectation for each of his children is that they will grow spiritually. Now, this can be seen by investigating two things from God's Word. What God the Father seeks from his children and what God the Father wants to see in his children. So by looking at these two things, what God the Father seeks and what he wants to see, we will discover what his expectation is for both you and for me. Let's start by looking at what God the Father seeks from his children. We see this through two passages, primarily through two passages. The first one, we see this. God the Father seeks fruit from his people. We see this in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 5 to 9. Let's look at Luke chapter 13, verses 5 to 9. In verse 5, we read this. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here we see Christ is calling the people of Israel to repent. And then he goes on in verse 6 to say this. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. 
Now, this, perhaps the simplest way to understand this parable from Jesus is this. The owner of the vineyard represents God the Father. The vine dresser or the gardener represents Jesus. And the, the tree there represents Israel. And it would seem that Israel had been given three years. The three years refer to Jesus' three years of ministry. They were given three years to respond to his offer of the kingdom, which I believe was a genuine offer. And because they weren't responding, because they weren't responding by bearing fruit, the command was to cut down the tree. And Jesus pleads for a little bit more time. But of course, sadly, in that time, Israel in general did not respond. Instead, they crucified him. But what we see from this is very clear. God the Father seeks fruit from his people. If he sought that from the children of Israel, he also seeks it from us, his spiritual children. But we also see that Jesus seeks fruit from his disciples. We see this in John chapter 15, verse 16. John chapter 15, verse 16 says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It's very clear here. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So let's ask a question. If God the Father seeks fruit from his people, and if Jesus seeks fruit from his disciples, what do you think God seeks from his children? What do you think Jesus seeks from his brothers? Surely God desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually, that we will bear fruit. Now, what we've seen so far is this. God the Father's expectation for each of his children is that they will grow spiritually. Now, what a, this can be seen from investigating two things from God's word. The first thing is what God the Father seeks from his children, and we've seen that he seeks fruit. But the second way we can see God's expectation for both you and I is by looking at what God the Father wants to see in his children. And this is beautifully depicted in Psalm, the first Psalm, Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. And this gives us a beautiful picture of what God wants to see in his children. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now what will be the outcome if he avoids the company of sinful men, and if he meditates deeply on God's word? What is the outcome? Now God draws a beautiful picture. He says this, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Can you picture that? Can you visualize a tree planted beside a stream bearing fruit in season? Its leaf does not wither. That is what God wants to see in you and I. That is what he dreams our lives will be. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually. Now we've already considered God the Father's expectation for his children. Now we want to move on to the second concept. Our understanding of spiritual growth needs to be based upon three central concepts. The first one is God the Father's expectation for spiritual growth. And what we've seen is he seeks fruit and he wants to see fruit. Now let us move on to the second part of this talk, the second concept. What is God the Father's definition of spiritual growth? Now, we're going to begin by considering a theological definition of spiritual growth. This definition has been compiled from a number of different men. And this is a definition, I think it's a short and a quite precise definition. Spiritual growth is the divine process 
that causes a Christian to change over time so that they become more and more like Christ. I'll repeat that again because this is important. Spiritual growth is the divine process that causes a Christian to change over time so that they become more and more like Christ. Now, I just want you to notice a few words there. The first one is this. It's a divine process. That shows us that we cannot do it in our own strength. But the second word I want you to notice is the word process. This shows that spiritual growth has a number of stages, a number of steps involved. There is not just an immediate product. But if we go through this process by the grace of God, by His divine power, what happens? The product is this. God causes a Christian to change over time so that they become more and more like Christ. We take on a family likeness. We become more like God. He desires for His children to be like Him. Now, let's ask a question. Is this definition actually firmly based on God's Word? I believe it is. And, I, and as we go through this series of talks, we will see many, many scriptures that will support that definition. But at the moment, I just want us to consider one. That is Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 14 to 15. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 14 to 15. This is what Paul says in those verses. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Now, sometimes with some of Paul's statements, they are very technical. And it helps just to take away all the supporting arguments and just look at the core concept. I want to do this by just looking at the first part of verse 14 and then going straight to the second part of verse 15. If we do that, this is what we read. Then we will no longer be infants. Instead, we will in all things grow up into Christ. There you see it. There is a process. We will go from being infants, spiritual infants, to being mature spiritually. And what is that? It is growing in all things, not just in some things, not just in many things, but in all things, growing in all things up into Christ, becoming more and more like Christ. So what we have seen so far is this. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually to become more and more like him. Now, what I've just told you is actually this whole study in one sentence. We're not quite finished yet because there is a third concept that we need to understand. But until now, this is what we've studied. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually to become more and more like him. When I began this talk, I said that our understanding of spiritual growth needs to be based upon three central concepts. The first concept is God the Father's expectation for spiritual growth. He seeks fruit and he wants to see fruit. And then we looked at the second concept, God the Father's definition of spiritual growth. What is that? That we would grow up and become more like Christ. Now we want to look at the third concept. And this is an important concept. That is God the Father's motivation for spiritual growth. Why does God seek fruit? Why does he want to see it? Why does he want us to grow to become more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? In short, God the Father desires for His children to grow spiritually for His own glory and for His children's own good. I'll repeat that. In short, God the Father desires for His children to grow spiritually for His own glory and for His children's own good. Now let's look at those two motivations for spiritual growth. The first one is God, the motivation that God would be glorified. We see this motivation quite clearly in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 9 to 11. 
Philippians chapter 1 and verses 9 to 11. This is what the ESV translation says. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What we see here is Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi. And what was his prayer? It's that they would grow. Look at the terminology, that their love will abound more and more so that their knowledge and their discernment would increase. And what he wants to see ultimately is this, that they would be pure and blameless. What does that mean? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And why does he long to see this? Why is he praying to God for this? To the glory and praise of God. Now we need to ask a question. How does God's children bearing spiritual fruit bring Him glory? It, from one sense, it doesn't seem to make sense. But it will help us if we study what God's glory actually is. And there's a passage that will help us to do this. It is in Exodus chapter 33. Now what we need to understand is this. The glory of God is actually the composite of His attributes. When we see the goodness of God's character, we actually are seeing His glory. Or in other words, God's glory becomes evident when we see the goodness of His character. Let's see that God's glory is the composite of His character. And we will see this from Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 to 19. And we'll see here that Moses is requesting something from God. Let's read those verses. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Moses has requested to see God's glory. And what did God say? God said, I will pass before you. And when I pass before you, I will tell you my name, Yahweh. But not only that, he then goes on to say, I will show you my character. For there he says, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Moses will see God's glory when he sees his character. In effect, this is what John MacArthur says about this passage. In effect, God was telling Moses that his glory is the composite of his attributes. Now, in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 7, God fulfills Moses' requests. Let's read Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Do you see what God has done there? First thing we see, he pronounced his name two times. In Hebrew, when a name is repeated two times, it is extremely significant. Now, this was not the first time God revealed his name, his personal name, Yahweh, the great I am. But here he repeats it two times. And then he says, you will know me. You will see my glory when you see my character. And he tells Moses, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. What we see there is that when we see the goodness of God, when we see his character, we see his glory. Now let us come back to Philippians chapter 1 and verses 9 to 11. What we see here is this. When we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, this brings God glory and praise. In a small, faint way, we are reflecting the character of God, the goodness of God. If we use a simple example like the moon, 
we know that the moon does not have any source of light itself. But we can see the moon at night in the background of a dark sky because the moon is reflecting part of the sun's light. Not the full light, but part of it. And when we see that, it shines out in the darkness. Now, what we see there is not actually the glory of the moon. We are actually seeing the glory of the sun reflected in the moon. And that is a picture of why God is so motivated to seek fruit in his children and to see his children bear fruit. Because he longs to see his character, his goodness reflected in his children. We see this once again in a different passage. We see it in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3. Now, before I read these verses, it's important for us to notice that Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2 is actually referring to Christ's first com coming. That is verse 2a, from verse 1 to verse 2a. These verses were read out by Christ when he taught in the synagogue. We read that in Luke chapter 4. And he stopped at the end of 2a because that would be all that he would do in his first coming. I will read verses 1 and 2a. Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2a. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. Now Jesus stopped there because that was fulfilled. I believe that was fulfilled in his first coming. But he didn't continue to read on. But now we will read on to part verse 2a to verse 3. He says this, And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. When will this happen? I believe this will happen in Jesus' second coming. This is describing what will happen with Israel in his second coming. And then from verse 4 to 11, it explains the conditions of the millennial kingdom. But let's finish off. Let's come back to verse 3 and finish off. Then what we read is this. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, that is very, very interesting. In the ESV, it says this, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So what we have seen here is this. When God's children display his character, he is glorified. We see this in another passage. We see it in John chapter 15 and verse 8. This is in a very, John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8 is a very important passage on spiritual growth. And we will look at that in our third study. But for the moment, I'm just going to read verse 8. It says this, John chapter 15 verse 8 in the ESV. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Look at this. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. I hope it is very, very evident to you by now that the first motivation for why God wants to see his children bear fruit and grow spiritually is for his glory. Now let's understand something. It is not wrong for God to want to, want to be glorified. It is wrong for me to want to be glorified. Why is that? Because I am not God. But it is right for God to want to be glorified. If God wanted anyone else to be glorified, he would be denying that he is the one true God that is worthy of all glory and praise. So it is not selfish when God wants to see himself glorified in his children's spiritual growth. It's not selfish. In fact, it's beautiful. And what a privilege you and I have to be able to, to show forth the glory of God. So what we see here is this. This is the summary so far. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually to become more and more like him for his glory. Now we could stop there. That is enough. But we already know that there is a second motivation 
There's a second reason that God is motivated to seek fruit in His children and to see His children bear fruit and to see them grow spiritually to become more like Christ. What is that second motivation? It is actually for His children's good. Let's come back now to Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3. And we just want to look at, in particular, at the first word in that verse. It says this, Blessed is the man. It says, Blessed is the man who stays away from the company of sinners. I'll read it to you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Why is he blessed? We see it depicted. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now, when we grow spiritually, what happens? God calls us blessed. A more freer and a more, a not so literal translation would be this. Oh, how happy is the man. Perhaps a little bit better translation would be this. It is well with the man or it is good for the man. So what we see here is God not only desires us to grow spiritually for his glory, but for our own good. We see this again in the Beatitudes, particularly in Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 and verse 8. And you will, be, you will notice that the word blessed comes up again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. This is from the ESV translation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those two verses are amazing. The first one is this. It says this. Oh, how happy. Or it is well with a man and a, a child of God whose hunger and thirst is for righteousness. Why is that? That thirst and that hunger will take them to God. And when they come to God, they will be satisfied. But it goes further. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. Oh, how happy is the man who is pure in heart. Why is he happy? Because he will see God. When I was younger and my first immediate observations of this passage, I believed that this would come true when we went to heaven. Blessed are those who are pure in heart by trusting Christ. Our hearts are purified from sin. We are reckoned with Christ's righteousness. God views us through the righteousness of his son and we will see God. And that is true. This is, I believe, talking about a future event, our glorification. But I also believe it is true for the present, our sanctification. I believe that when we pursue purity and holiness, we enjoy a small glimmer, a small aspect of this statement now. We see God and we see him at work in us and through us to his glory. I don't know whether you've ever experienced a time where you've lived in a cycle of sin and then by God's grace you have turned and you've pursued purity and you've become more holy and you're enjoying personal holiness. And you will notice that when you are in that state, you can see God, you see him in your life and you see him working through you. And I believe this is one of the most motivating reasons for us to want to pursue spiritual growth because when we pursue spiritual growth we actually enjoy a deeper and more intimate relationship with Jesus we see him at work in our lives and through our lives when I was growing up I actually went to a Christian school and the the school motto or the or the slogan for that school was this grow up into Christ Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 Sadly, when I was a teenager, I didn't realize how special that motto was. And it hadn't become a motto for my life. I'd been brought up in a Christian family. And at a young age, I had trusted in Christ. But 
sadly, as I went into my teenage years, I looked at unsaved friends who were partying and, and were drinking and taking drugs and doing all these other things, which they described was fun and would make me happy. And sadly, I did not follow the motto of my school. Instead, I enjoyed sin for a season. And what is really, really sad is that during that season, what I realized is it was not happiness. It was not good for me to be away from God's word and from God's will. And they were some of the most miserable days in my life. What I realized during that period was this, that in fact, it is for my good to do what God commands. Because when he gives commands, he not only gives them for his glory, but he gives them for our good. And so now we can come and we can see the summary for this whole talk. You will notice that when I do these studies, I will try to sum up the whole talk in one or two sentences. This is the summary of what we've studied so far. And this will show us the overall purpose for spiritual growth. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually to become more and more like him, both for his glory and for our good. I'll say that again. This is the overall purpose for spiritual growth. God's desire for each and every one of his children is that they will grow spiritually to become more and more like him, both for his glory and for our good. Now, what I'd like to do now before I can conclude is just to give you an overview of what we will study in the following talks. And when I give you this over, overview, I am hoping that it will encourage you and it will spur you on to want to follow this series from the beginning to the very end. In the second talk, we will study the foundational principle for spiritual growth. And there we will learn an important secret that many, many believers are not aware of. And that talk will actually provide the foundation for the rest of the talks. Make sure you follow the second study, the foundational principle for spiritual growth. In the third study, we will look at the utmost priority for spiritual growth. And in this talk, we will actually focus on Christ's role in our spiritual growth. And that is a really, really important study to follow because this will show us what has to become the number one priority in our relationship with Christ. I hope you will follow that study. In the fourth study, we will look at the general process of spiritual growth. You will be aware that I told you that spiritual growth is a process. It's a divine process. And therefore, it is made up of stages or it's made up of steps. Well, in that fourth talk, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick picture of the whole process of spiritual growth from stage one through, and we will see a big picture. That is a really important study for you to follow, because when you follow that study, it will actually give you an outline. It will give you a life plan for spiritual growth. Then in the fifth study, what we will do is in the following four studies, we will come back and we'll actually focus on the stages of spiritual growth specifically. And we will unpack them and we'll look at what the scriptures have to say about them. In the fifth study, we will look at the core problem that hinders spiritual growth. This is a really, really important study because often what happens with believers is they are allowing things into their lives that are actually poisoning their spiritual growth. And that is a really important study. Then in the sixth study, we will consider the basic precondition for experiencing ongoing spiritual growth. Now, in that study, we will look at the importance of God's word and we'll see how the Holy Spirit uses God's word and we'll see a prerequisite for spiritual growth. Then in the seventh study, we'll look at the major prop for spiritual growth. And we'll see there the, the important role that other believers play in our spiritual growth. And so what you'll see is as we go through these studies, we'll look at the role that Christ plays. We'll look at the role that the Holy Spirit plays. We'll, plays. we'll see that in the fourth study in the general process. We'll see the role that the scriptures play. And we'll also see the role that other saints play. And then in our final study, that is the key promoters of spiritual growth. We'll see how 
it is important for us to take God at his word, to reckon by faith what he says. And we'll see how God uses time and trials and our trust to produce fruit in our lives. It is my hope that you will be excited about this study on spiritual growth. And it is my hope that it will result in growth and change to the glory of God and for your good. What I'd like us to do now is to conclude. And I'd like us to come back to the story of my son. I can still remember when my son was almost one year old and it was so exciting to see him grow and develop. And one thing I noticed about him was he was never satisfied staying at the same level. For instance, initially he would be being fed milk, but he would sit, my wife would teach him to sit at the dinner table. And as he sat, he would watch us taking food to our mouths and he, I could tell by his eyes, he wanted some of that. And my wife would start introducing food and he didn't only want to be fed by my wife, he wanted to learn how to feed himself. And then I noticed shortly after that, he started crawling. But he wasn't satisfied crawling around on the ground. He started to try and take steps. And then when he started to walk, he wasn't satisfied just walking, he wanted to run. And when he could run, he wasn't satisfied running, he wanted to play. And what I noticed is a healthy child is not satisfied to stay at an elementary infantile level. They always want to move on to greater levels of growth and maturity. Well, sadly, we don't always see this in believers. There are many, many believers who are satisfied at still being infants in their spiritual growth, being child, being having childlike maturity. Now we're to have childlike faith, but we're not to have childlike maturity. They rather than wanting to feed themselves, they depend on other people feeding them. Rather than standing by faith upon God's word, they need other people to prop them up. But what we see is this, from the people in the New Testament that provide an example for us, people who were used for God's glory and people who grew to become like Christ, what we see is they were not satisfied staying at an elementary infantile level. They wanted to press on. We see this especially with Paul himself. We see it in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 14. Let's read Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, and let's see Paul's example when it comes to spiritual growth. This is what Paul says. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What an amazing picture. Paul says he's not perfect. But what he does say is this. He presses on and he's constantly pressing on. He's trying to go into new pioneering areas of spiritual growth. He's pressing on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In fact, we see the author of Hebrews give a similar call. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 in the NIV translation, we read this. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. There is a call. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. And that is a call that I want each and every one of us to hear. God is calling us through this talk to leave the lower infantile stages of spiritual growth and to move on to maturity. And he's calling this because he wants to see his children grow to become more like him. And he wants to see us bear fruit. He wants to see this for his glory and for our good. Will we listen to his calling? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have so many things to thank and praise you for.
And we want to thank you for your son. And we want to thank you for all the spiritual blessings that we receive through your son. We not only receive salvation, but we receive sonship through your son, through his death and through his resurrection. We are adopted and become your children. And we thank you for this privilege. And dear Heavenly Father, we are challenged as we've just looked at your call for each and every one of us. You are calling us. You are calling me. You are calling each and every person who has listened to this study. You are calling us to grow, to become more like you. And you've told us why. So that we as your children would have the privilege and the honour of bringing you glory. And so that we would also enjoy your goodness in our lives. And as in we enjoy your goodness, this in return will reveal your glory. People will see our joy. People will see our happiness. People will see our delight. People will see our satisfaction in you. And that will draw them to you, to your goodness, to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to be faithful in following this series on spiritual growth and to applying your truth in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen.